Hi, it's Dr. Bob Stark again, um, and today's uh, lecture is on something called interrupts. So to kind of motivate this, let's step away from the, the computer, the assembly code for a minute, um, and just think about a task we might do every day, like loading the dishwasher. Um, you know, assume we've got a bowl, a cup, a fork, a spoon, and a plate we need to, to put in there. Here are the 10 steps we might go through um, to execute our loading the dishwasher program. We pick up the bowl, we put the bowl in the dishwasher. We pick up the cup, we put the cup in the dishwasher. We pick up the fork, we put the fork in the dishwasher. Pick up the spoon, put the spoon in the dishwasher. Pick up the plate, put the plate in the dishwasher. Very, very rote, very uh, simplistic, but uh, it gives us something to work with. This is so just a a, a program, a line, a line of steps we go through to, to perform this task. Now, imagine while you're, you're in the process of loading the dishwasher, uh, your parent or your wife or husband or, other, or significant other um, interrupts you. So you've got the fork in your hand and um, you, they ask you to go take out the trash. Now, how does this affect the sequence of events? You need to take out the trash right now. What you might do is pause where you are. So you've got the cup in the dishwasher. Um, and we go, excuse me, out to, to handle taking the garbage. We get the garbage bag out of the waste bin. You walk outside. You put the garbage bag in the curbside bin, then you go back inside, and then you resume what you were doing with the dishwasher. So now you can pick up the fork, put it in the dishwasher, pick up the spoon, put it in the dishwasher, pick up the plate, put it in the dishwasher. Yeah, spelling. Uh, this is what we think of when we think about an interrupt. You were working on one process, you had to pause it to go do something else, and when you were done with that something else, you come back to the original project and, and, or process and pick back up where you left off. When a computer services an interrupt, that is basically what it's doing. It's been running one program, and somewhere in the middle of that program while it's running, it pauses the program, goes off and, and um, executes a different program or a different bit of code. When it's done with that, it comes back and picks up where it was with, the, with that original program. Um, and what's more, the original program has no idea what has happened. It's completely transparent to, to that process. So an interrupt is a formalization of this. It pauses the currently executing program in order to run a higher priority program. And we actually see this a lot with oper operating systems. In fact, it's integral to the concept of multitasking, where you can run multiple programs concurrently. Um, you know, in the simplest case where you only have one uh, computer processor, and a computer processor can only run one program at a time, multitasking pauses one program to execute another. Then that's paused to execute another, and that's paused to execute another, and we just kind of go round and round, pausing one program, loading another one onto the CPU. Now, in modern times, when we have multiple CPUs and multiple cores, we can run a few more things uh, concurrently, but um, the base case is still still there. That you know we typically have more programs than we do cores. Um, and uh, we have to come use this concept of multitasking with interrupts to stop one uh, process uh, to move on to the next. Um, we also use this in debuggers. So if you're debugging a program like we've been doing in class um, and we have a breakpoint where that program stops, we use interrupts to implement those breakpoints. Um, we also use them to communicate with peripherals. So a program may request data from a disk. Just due to the, the, the nature of hardware, um, it takes a long time from the computer processor's perspective for data to be read off of a disk. That's time that processor could be spent doing something else useful. 
So oftentimes a program, when it initiates a read from disk, will voluntarily um, pause itself uh, using an interrupt, uh, put itself asleep so that other uh, programs can execute um, in the meantime. Um, other things we might do, we might pause a program uh, to wait for input from the keyboard or more appropriately to poll the keyboard to see if, there, if it has input. Um, all these are things we can do with interrupts. Um, so we're going to be looking at this uh, from, from the 6502's standpoint, um, and it has two kinds of interrupts, um, hardware and software. Uh, a hardware interrupt is generated by the hardware. Usually it means that one of the, the input-output pins on the CPU receives a signal that says the program needs to be interrupted. Um, and there's several possibilities here. One of the most common is simply a clock signal. A, uh, a one is, is, or a zero is written to a, to a pin to indicate that a certain amount of time has passed. So uh, CPUs often have, a, or I say CPUs, a motherboard often has a clock device separate from the CPU. And all that clock does is generate periodic um, signals. Um, and you know, to, to kind of measure the passage of time. So when one of those signals is received at the CPU uh, on a certain pin, it interprets it as an interrupt saying, okay, time has passed, I need to do something. Um, we can also get interrupts from other devices like network cards or disks um, that all have, can have meanings. Uh, the other kind of interrupt is a software interrupt. Um, a program voluntarily interrupts itself. Um, and again, the, the idea of waiting on data from a disk is a, is a common um, scenario there. As the yellow box says, regardless of, of, of which type, we're pretty much going to handle these um, in, in the same way. All right, so let's look at how uh, the 6502 handles interrupts. Now, compared to modern systems, it's pretty simple in how it does that. But the concept is there. Um, this gives you a good overview of, of how to deal with, with interrupts, um, and you know, especially as they pertain to a kernel or operating system. Um, so here's the, the, the sequence of events. A program is running and an interrupt is received, immediately pausing that program. Uh, what the 6502 is going to do is it's going to take the program counter and the status register and push those to the stack. So there's, those, those are two byte, or one byte each, so a total of two bytes. Those are going to be pushed to the stack. And I'll explain in a minute why we do that. Um, after that, we'll look and see what was the cause of the interrupt and use that cause um, to select an appropriate set of handler code. Then we'll run that handler code, and when it's done, we'll pull the program counter and the status register back off the stack and continue with our program execution. When we talk about pulling, uh, pushing the PC and status register to the stack and then pulling it back when we're done, we call, this is called saving the program's context. And I'll speak a little more about context towards the end of the lecture, but um, in this particular case, the context is the PC and the status register. It is the bare minimum of information we need to define the program that was running before the interrupt occurred. In other words, we have to know where in the program we were when we stopped. That's what the PC does. It, you know, so when we come back, we, have, we, we load in that PC and can continue executing from that point on. Um, we also need to know uh, the information in that status register um, because you know, the C flag or the zero flag or the, the negative flag, all those things could have been important to the program at that point in time. So we don't want to lose that. In other words, all the information needed, um, actually not all, but the bare amount of information needed um, to uh, restore our program back to its running state. So we do that. We push before uh, the interrupt occurs. We pull after the interrupt is done. And then we can com continue with our program execution. Now, a couple terms, the interrupt handler and the interrupt vector. Um, interrupt handler is just a fancy way of saying 
this is the code that we run when an interrupt happens. It's all it is. It's a place, it's a place in, the, in memory that we jump to. We execute some code. When we're done, we'll jump back. You can, it's usually just a subroutine. The interrupt vector is a, a memory address that holds the address of an interrupt handler. So the vector is not the interrupt handler's address itself. It is a location that um, the kernel or the 6502, depending on kind of which level of abstraction we're looking at. It's a memory location that it knows to find the address of our handler. And here are the, the vectors on the 6502 itself. Um, and these are hardwired in, so, um, and, and it will always look in these specific places in your memory. Um, the very last two uh, bytes of memory in our address space, so FFFE and FFFF, so the very top of the address space, is the vector for handling what we call IRQ and break interrupts. Um, I'll talk about IRQ in a minute. These are the maskable hardware interrupts. And then break is a software interrupt. This is actually the one we use for uh, debugging purposes. Um, there is a vector called reset, and it's right before the next, uh, before the IRQ break one. It's at FFFC and FFFD. So those two bytes define that address. Um, it's handler for code executed on startup. So when we turn the Commodore 64 on, or if we reboot it while it's already on, what we call a warm reboot, that um, every time that, that occurs, we jump to the reset vector and uh, execute the code there. Um, and then the last one, uh, at FFFA to FFFB, are the non-maskable hardware interrupts. Um, not something we're really going to use, but you just know they're there. We're mainly going to concern ourselves with the, the maskable ones, the IRQs. So an IRQ stands for an interrupt request, um, and it's signal usually sent by a peripheral device uh, to indicate that it needs the CPU. Um, and in our case, the, the peripheral device is actually going to be the system clock in all, all cases. Um, but other things can, can also uh, do an IRQ request. These are what we call maskable. That, means, that simply means you can turn IRQ uh, servicing routines off temporarily. Um, and the reason we might want to do that um, is to install a new IRQ routine. <laughs> so we turn all IRQs off because we don't want interruptions while we're changing, modifying our kernel code. Um, we can turn them off using the SEI instruction. Once we've installed our new IRQ, we turn all maskable IRQs back on using the CLI, and now we have um, we have either modified the, the existing IRQ handlers or we simply added another one. Uh, and if all that can continue processing. Um, just as a contrast to that, the non mesquerel interrupts, they ignore the SEI and CLI instructions. They will always run. Okay. This slide and the next is actually specific to how the Commodore 64 kernel um, handles IRQs. It adds a little bit more to what's the default with the 6502, but this is what we're going to be dealing with. So when an IRQ occurs, in other words, the interrupt signal has been, has been sent to the, the 6502, it is going to immediately look at um, FFFE and FFFF, and it expects an address to be there. So whatever address is there, it's going to jump to that address. In this case, it's always going to be FF48. It's going to jump to that and execute whatever code is there. Um, on the Commodore 64 kernel, um, that code always ends with a jump to the uh, address in 0314. Now, it doesn't jump to 0314 and execute the code there. It jumps to what is contained in there. And remember, that's what the parentheses mean here. That's an indirect um, memory address. It says, 
look up what's in this address and jump to that. So it's going to look at what's in 0314 to 0315, grab that address, and jump to it. So by default, that's EA31, and there is more kernel code at that address that gets executed uh, before returning back to your program. Um, so main thing to point out here is everything right here is uh, hardwired into ROM. So we can't change the jump to FF48. That will always happen, and the code that is there will always be uh, executed, meaning the code will always jump to what is stored in 0314 and execute that. The, code, the address stored in 0314, though, can be changed, and we're going to use that, uh, that knowledge to install our own uh, request handler, which happens here. So once again, um, if we have a, an IRQ, we can, you know, it starts by executing, uh, seeing what's at FFE and FFFF, which is, again, going to be FF48, so it's going to execute what's there. Um, and at the end, it's going to jump to the contents oops, of 0314. And in this case, we have changed the address into 0314 uh, to be something different. I just picked 5000 because it, was, it looked cool and um, was easy to remember. Let's say that I install some code there. Um, it'll be multiple lines long, but at the end... I put in an explicit jump to EA31, which was the, the, the kernel's IRQ handler code. Stuff we still want to execute on every IRQ. So now, it's, I, what I've effectively done is shoved my custom code in before what the system needs to do. Let's take a look at that a, diff a slightly different way. Here's our default. An IRQ comes in and it examines the contents of this memory address, always. Well, on, on the Commodore 64, the contents are always going to be FF48. So it executes the code starting at FF48. And at the end of that, we jump to the contents of 0314. So we look at what's at 0314. It says it's EA31. And we execute the kernel code at EA31. Then we're done, we go back to our, pro our original program. What we're going to do when we install our custom IRQ code is we're going to change the value at 0314 to be a different address. So now our IRQ request comes in. Once again, it looks at FFFE and FFFF for an address. And that's always going to be FF48. So we jump to FF48 execute the code there, and at the very end of it is a jump instruction, and we jump to the contents of 0314. So we look at 0314, and we see the contents are 5000. And we're going to jump to that code first. So this is where we would write our custom code. So anything we want to, we want to execute while the, the IRQ is being serviced, we put here. And we make sure at the end of it to put a jump to EA31, which is the kernel handler code. That should still run. Uh, by doing that, we make sure that any, uh, like any routines, particularly there's a keyboard servicing routine in there, uh, we want to make sure that stuff still runs before we return, our, uh, we, we return uh, execution back to our original program. So, strategies for, uh, for setting this up. First thing what we do is whatever code we want uh, as, as our handler, just write it as a subroutine. We start it with a label, and we end it with an RTS. I'm sorry, we start with a label, we don't end it as an RTS. Sorry about that. I'll, we, we actually end it with that jump to uh, EA31. But it, otherwise, it looks like a subroutine. And whatever our main is, I think we've been calling this the program start um, section of code. First thing we do is we disable our interrupts with SEI. Uh, this 
basically keeps the normal IRQ uh, routines from happening while we set this up. Whatever that uh, subroutine we wrote as a handler, we write its address into those two uh, memory locations using a little Indian uh, setup. And then once we do that, um, we re-enable our, our interrupts with uh, CLI. So let's look at a, at a sample of this. All right, here we're assuming that this is my handler routine. Um, I've got a comment just to say this is where your code would normally go. Um, and at the very end of it, we have a jump to EA31 because that will jump us to um, the kernel's uh, handler routine. And this is everything in the program start section. SEI instruction to disable the interrupts. Uh, load into the accumulator the low byte of, of your routine. Oops, let's change that because I'm not being consistent here. There we go. It's actually my handler. So load in the low byte of my handler. Store that to 0314. Load in the high byte of, of, that, of that my handler address. Store it to 0315. Remember, this is the location that our call chain of uh, interrupt services will look at. Um, Re-enable our interrupts so that our interrupts start processing again. And then we return from basic. This was our program. All it really did was install my handler as part of the kernel. And even though we've returned from our program, uh, the kernel is still running in the background and it's executing our code every time the interrupt is triggered. And then, like I, I hopefully I mentioned this before, the interrupt gets triggered by, by a clock signal. Uh, if I recall, it's, uh, running a, it's running 60 times a second, I believe. Uh, last thing, uh, let's talk a little bit more about machine state. Um, technically, the machine state is the contents of all registers, including the accumulator, X and Y, PC, and the status register. Um, and this, is, this goes more broadly for, for all uh, CPU types, because most CPUs have a lot of registers and things that go with them. Um, our best practice is to push all of that to the stack uh, before we service and interrupt and then pull it all off the stack when we're done um, and the reason behind that is our executing program may have values in the accumulator and the x and y registers that we want to to use when it resumes you know those things may have been important uh, in the middle of processing and we don't want to corrupt that by our interrupt service routine uh, if though the, if they get written to by that um, Again, the idea here is make everything exactly as it was uh, before the interrupt occurred. Um, I mentioned this before, the 6502 only hand pushes the PC and the status register automatically. And um, my guess is the reason behind that is the stack is uh, very limited in space. Uh, PC and the status register are the bare minimum that's required. Um, the Commodore 64 kernel, uh, whenever it executes its ROM code, um, it will actually push the accumulator X and Y as well and, and pull them off when it's done. So we don't have to do that ourselves. Uh, it will do that for us, but uh, you know, make sure you know that, that that's going on. Um, on more modern CPUs, it will usually push all the register state um, to, the, to the stack automatically because we assume to ha have more stack space. Um, when we look at... Uh, bigger operating systems, more modern operating systems, uh, the machine state uh, or the process context really when, when we do this is uh, includes a lot of other things too. So you have uh, everything that's in memory uh, gets actually get, gets pushed to a stack or sometimes even pushed out to hardware disk. Um, any open files uh, are, are part of the state as well. All those things get saved um, you know, when we interrupt one program and, and do another because all those things are part of uh, the executing program and need to be uh, restored when we come back. All right, um, from here on out, the we want to work on the project. It will deal with, um, you know, installing your own custom handler routine.
Um, if you have questions with this, please let me know.